Okay, our next speaker, the last one before the break, is Melissa Wilson Sayers, and she's a computational biologist who studies uh, mutation rates and sex differences and other cool things about population differences with sex and sex bias and genomics is her talk. Okay. Yeah, we'll see if I can stand still. Great. Okay. Um, so, yes, I'm trained as a mathematician and Every single day. Oh, wow! I'm just my. Haven't touched anything. <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't. I didn't touch it. It's all right. It's like slide roulette. I'll um, I'll get there eventually. Or um. And every single day, biology is fascinating to me, and so I'm really thrilled to be here with you all today. And hopefully, we have time for questions. I'm affiliated with the Center for Evolution and Medicine at Arizona State University. So I am an evolutionary and population geneticist, and I am interested in, in sex differences, but I come at it from how does understanding evolution and genetics then inform sex differences? Great, okay, so we'll go over sex chromosomes, alignments, and then um, why I think evolution is actually important for our alignment and then our understanding of sex differences. So, um, we talk about a lot of different things in here. We talk about genetics, we talk about the genetic differences, we talk about gonadal differences, so in hormones and organization and activation. Um, and we also, gender is important here, but they are distinct. And I think one of the great things about the center um, is, is that there's discussion of all of those things and there's overlap and interplay. And mainly I'm interested in the genetic sex differences. We're getting into some of these other, the gonadal hormones and, and gender, but but I just wanted to be clear that I'm mainly talking about genetic differences. Um, so I thought we could start with death and go up from there, right? So leading causes of death according to the Center for Disease Control. So what's the leading cause of death for men? Anyone? Heart disease, right? What about leading cause of death for women? Heart disease also. You are an excellent and brilliant audience. But as has been talked about, most of the embryonic stem cell lines, most of the stem cell lines in general, most of the clinical research has been done, has been done in men, and particularly men of European descent. And so we know a lot about heart disease in white men, and we know a lot less about heart disease and symptoms and treatments in women. And we know, but we know that they differ, right? Okay, and so number two for everyone, so if, if that hamburger that you had for lunch is not going to kill you, then cancer, probably from the carcinogens in the meat, is going to get you. Number three is where we start to differ. So stroke um, is the third leading cause of death for women. And in fact, it kills 2% uh, more, which at this rate is, is, is pretty high. And I'm certain that this has nothing at all to do with the third leading cause of death for men, which is unintentional injuries, killing more people, in fact, than stroke. Um, it's number six for women, about half the rate. So we know there are behavioral differences in humans. Number four for everyone is chronic lower respiratory disease, which doesn't get a lot of attention. And number five, which is, is Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's doesn't actually show up until number eight for men. And I, you may be hearing a little bit about Alzheimer's today, but if not, I wanted to point out that we typically think of Alzheimer's as a disease of aging, but even when you do age correction, you still see that women are getting Alzheimer's disease at a higher rate than men. So we know that there are some sex differences here. And there may be, it may be due to societal gender differences, it may be due to socioeconomic status in interacting with the genetics that we have. But with all of this, there's this like glaring elephant in the room that we have XX and XY, and the X chromosome is only reported in about 33% of genome-wide association studies. This doesn't even mean that they actually analyzed the X chromosome. It just means that in their GWAS results, they said, oh yeah, we also aligned to the X chromosome. Um, in many cases, in many papers I'll go through, and, and I, I can't find anything about the sex chromosomes. The Y chromosome, in fact, is even more ignored, that poor, poor thing. Um, so what about sex chromosomes? I want to go over evolution of them briefly and why I think it's important. So we, we've heard actually already today about how important X and Y are in sex differences in different diseases, but how did... How do they get there? Why do we even have X and Y chromosomes? X and Y are shared across mammals, um, and in fact, not even all mammals. Um, 
but not all species even have genetic sex determination. Not all species have chromosomal sex determination. Sex can be determined by environment. It can be determined by hormones. It can be determined by temperature. Or you may not even have separate sexes. We have these wonderful whip-tailed lizards in Arizona um, that are all parthenogenic. They're all females. Um, so here's a karyotype of, uh, of humans, so a picture of our chromosomes. And you typically get one copy from genetic mom and one copy from genetic dad. I try to use the word typical because I don't know which one of us is normal. But typically, genetic females have two copies of the X. And typically, genetic males have an X and a Y. These chromosomes used to be indistinguishable from each other. They were a pair of homologous autosomes. They could recombine over their entire length about 160 million years ago. How do we know that? We know that because monotreme mammals, the egg-laying mammals, they do have males and females. They have a multi-X, multi-Y sex determination system, but their Xs and Ys are not homologous to ours. They're independently derived. So our XY system is shared with the marsupials, the pouched mammals. Um, and over the last 160 million years, the X has retained a lot of its gene content, and as I'll mention briefly, even gained a chunk of genes. It has about 155 million sites and 1,100 genes. And the Y chromosome has lost a lot of gene content. It's also gained a little bit of gene content, but, but largely there's about 27 unique genes on the Y chromosome. Some of those might have multiple copies. Some might have 76 copies, but really just 27 unique genes on, on the human Y chromosome. I maybe will stick up for it a little bit. I don't think it's entirely as worthless as we might like to joke. Um, but one thing that's really interesting is that in the absence of XY recombination, the Y has lost 90% of the genes it used to share with the X. That's a lot of content. And as we've heard and as we'll continue to hear, dosage is critical for a lot of genes. Dosage can be the difference between viability and inviability. And in particular, for whole chromosomes, aneuploidy, having a single copy of a chromosome is typically not compatible with life. And yet, many people in this room have a single copy of the X chromosome and seem to be perfectly compatible with life. So how did they become so different? So I want to go through this briefly, and then we'll get to the, the methodology part. So we have our ancestral autosomes, right, A, B, C, D, E, different locus, and they can recombine. That means they can swap DNA. So they have regions of DNA sequence similarity. If there's an error in one side, you can switch it with the other. And at some point, we think there's sex-determining region of the Y. It was also called TDF, testes-determining factor. Um, and, and it's not a gene yet, it's just an allele. It's just a variant of a gene, and individuals who inherit the variant of this gene, SRY, will go on to develop testes and make sperm, and individuals who don't inherit this, inherit this variant will go on to make ovaries um, and eggs. And you can have just allelic sex determination. This occurs in other species. We've observed allelic sex determination. We don't have separate sex chromosomes yet. But if something comes along, like a sexually antagonistic allele, this is one theory, there's some other theories, but but this is one th theory that um, has some support for it. Um, if there's a sexually antagonistic allele, so in this case, an allele that is beneficial, it has to both be beneficial for testis havers and harmful for ovary havers. So if it's both of those things, then if something happens, like an inversion that keeps that thing that's good for testes havers with testes havers and out of ovary havers, it can sweep through the population. And so now you've had this inversion. You're, you're, these are separate genes now. They can't recombine. It's not a duplication event, because now you don't have double copies of them in the genome. It's, we call them gametologs sometimes, because it's a really unique way of becoming separate genes. But now we've lost the ability to recombine. So you get X-specific, Y-specific genes. And in the absence of recombination on the Y chromosome, you can accumulate mutations. You can accumulate deleterious mutations. Um, deletions, also insertions, and over time, oh yeah, and there was more than one inversion. I'll be here all night. Um, so we have our first inversion, our second inversion, and now we have separate groups of genes. We have some groups of genes that are more similar to each other because they quit recombining more recently, and we have sets of genes that are more differentiated from each other because they stopped recombining a long time ago. And because we're pretty unique, our X chromosome has maintained its gene order for millions of years, actually. The gene order between humans and elephants is largely conserved. Mice and rats, 
invert everything. They are very wonky and wonderful, I mean, but also weird. But here's a pic picture of the human X chromosome from the short arm to the long arm. And what Bruce Lon and David Page reported in 1999 is that they found four clusters of XY gene pairs. And on the Y axis here, what they're just showing is just how similar are X and Y. A large KS means X and Y are very, very different from each other. So they found this group of genes on the, on the distal arm of the X chromosome that are very, very different from each other. And then a set of group of genes a little closer that are pretty different and a third group that were not so different from each other, and a fourth group that were pretty similar to each other. So they called these evolutionary strata, which are like geologic strata, only instead of going from the top down, we go from the proximal arm to the distal arm. And we were able to see this in humans because of the conservation of gene order. Um, in 2005, with the sequencing of the human X and the human Y, looking at actual inversions that had occurred, a fifth evolutionary strata was identified. And then some work I did as a postdoc looking at motifs that were enriched in different parts of the chromosome, we proposed that there are at least nine of these evolutionary strata. So our X and Y, are, they're actively evolving across species. We see this variation, so it's still going on. And only the tips of the X and Y can recombine. So we have a pseudoautosomal region one, and humans kind of uniquely have a second pseudoautosomal region. It's a duplication and a translocation from the X to the Y. But these are the only regions where X and Y can still pair up so that they can actually recombine and sperm will only have one copy of the X or one copy of the Y. Um, so we know exactly where this inversion is. It's in a gene called XG. It's a blood group antigen gene. And one of the first projects I did when I started my lab at ASU is to say, well, maybe we can, look at, we can use population genetics. We can look at genetic diversity to say, can we observe where that boundary is just using population genetics? And, and the answer was no. Using genetic diversity, we didn't see a strict boundary between the recombining pseudoautosomal region and the non-recombining region, um, or the region that doesn't recombine in males on the X chromosome. And so we were a little surprised by that. Doesn't mean the boundary is fuzzy. We don't know, because you can still have recombination in XX individuals along that whole route. But what is important is to note is that inversion brought SRY immediately proximal to the pseudoautosomal boundary in us. And we see several conditions in humans where we have SRY living in places where potentially it shouldn't. So XX SRY positive individuals in De La Chapelle syndrome in a subset of individuals, they're XX with SRY. This is about one in 20,000 humans. Turner syndrome is individuals with a single X chromosome, but almost all of those cases, if you have just a single X and nothing else, no other piece of X or Y is inviable. But if you have a little chunk of X or a little chunk of Y, it tends to be viable. And it's about one in 2,500 live assigned female at birth. And Klinefelter syndrome is XXY, so two Xs and, and a Y. In all these cases, you need at least one X. You can have some other things going on. Klinefelter is between one in 500 and one in 1,000 live assigned male at birth. So these are not uncommon conditions at all in the human population. And so when we think about sex and gender, the way people are identifying themselves and behaving and the gonads that they're producing is not always compatible with the sex chromosome complement they have. What's most important here to note is that unlike trisomy 21, which is mostly maternal in origin and in increases with maternal age, both Turner and Klinefelter syndrome have a large paternal component to them. Um, so we think it, something might be going on with, with recombination here. OK, so <laughs> what does this matter for alignments, right? Well, evolution is critically important for alignments, as I'll argue, because of misalignment of reads, because X and Y are not, the Y didn't just blink into existence one day, some magical gift into our genome, right? It is the remnants of an X chromosome that has degraded over time. It shares sequence similarity with the X. In fact, 100% sequence similarity in the pseudoautosomal regions, and in other regions, high sequence similarity. So we're back to that picture of the karyotype and why this is important, because what do we do with alignments? We take a representative of each chromosome for, um, in our reference genome, and I'll take someone's genome, I'll take a cheek swab, and I'll chop it up into lots of little pieces, and I'll try to put that puzzle together against this genome, but I only use one copy of each of the autosomes. I just use one reference, right? I'm not giving you a reference A and a reference B for the maternal and paternal copies. I'm giving you one reference. But X and Y, in a default alignment, are always both included. 
that means we should have some expectations for relative depth. So we're aligning short reads to a genome, and you should have some number of depth for uh, genes on the X, uh, autosomes or genes on an X or a Y. Um, in an XX individual, it should be one to one. You should have two copies of each X, two copies of each autosome. In an XY individual, you should have twice as many, twice as much depth on an autosome because you have two copies relative to the Y chromosome. And I, I told you I was a math major, but I'm going to do a little bit of jazz hands here. So autosome to Y actually should be infinity, right? It, we shouldn't have any reads on a Y chromosome in an XX individual. That individual doesn't have a Y chromosome. There should be no reads there. I do it this way because it looks really nice for plotting because it's, spoiler, not zero. And autosome to Y should be two. But X and Y share an evolutionary origin. And what we see happening is we have our XX individual, all, what we typically do, take all the reads from eight, align them to our one reference of eight, and you just try to figure out what is from where. You can look for heterozygous sites. And our X chromosome, we'd like to align them all just to the X for that XX individual. But because of shared evolutionary history, some of those reads are going to go over to the Y chromosome. And what that means is then when we look at relative depth, for an XX individual, if we look at depth on chromosome 19 to Y, we see reads pulling out there. But this individual, we're fairly confident in many, many, for many reasons, they don't have a Y chromosome. But technically, we'll observe this. And part of the reason this came about is I was working with a student. I said, pull all the Y chromosome files, all the Y chromosome BAM files from this famous project, and let's look at genetic diversity across the Y chromosomes in this. And we were getting this very weird bimodal distribution of things. And it turned out that's because there was Y chromosome BAMs, reads from half the individuals that were all XX. And we couldn't trust any of them because they're not Y-linked reads. Um, and genetic males also we see, so they actually are about one to one. It just looks very skewed because of, uh, uh, for, uh, sorry, sorry. They're close to two to one here. Sorry, XX individuals are close to one to one, but it looks a little skewed because we're getting not a lot of reads on the Y chromosome, but enough to make a difference. So it turns out this is a problem for everything you do. It's a problem for exome capture. It's a problem for low coverage whole genome. It's a problem for high coverage whole genome. If you are doing sequencing, which is what we do now, this is a problem for you if you're working with species with sex chromosomes. Um, but the thing is, there's not a hard and fast rule, so it actually depends on the kind of sequencing you're looking at. Exome capture is just looking at exonic regions largely and maybe a little bits on the end. Um, and the, the read depth on X versus autosome or Y versus autosome is, is not exactly the same depending on the technology. But the point being that it's, it's always there. So we always get that a as a problem. So what does it mean? It means that um, you can get invited to a hackathon where you get to spend three days um, working with a group of people. I don't know, if so I, I was told there's a lot of students in the audience, undergraduates, graduate students. I, I don't get to spend three days just doing research, um, just ignoring emails, ignoring everything else. But here we got to spend three days working with a team, trying to develop a, a computational solution to this problem. And we came from all over, people who worked on humans, people who worked on plants, people who worked in single cell, and we discussed the problem, and we came up with this solution, X, Y, Align. Uh, a year later, we're actually finishing everything and, and, and getting it up. Um, but what it does is it'll compute your relative depth, and then based on your data, you can look at it and say, okay, these ones are grouping together, these ones, I believe, have a Y chromosome, and these ones are grouping together, these ones, I believe, don't have a Y chromosome, and based on that depth threshold, you can do a unique alignment. So if you say there's no Y chromosome, you should not be aligning to a genome with a Y in it. It's like you're, you're putting a, 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 a bad decoy there in your, in your genome. And so you should mask out the Y chromosome and remap to a genome that's missing the Y. But even if you have a Y chromosome, those pseudo-autosomal regions that are 100% identical, you should only have one copy of them in your reference genome. And so this software will do fun things if you like to do genomics, um, like put out quality and depth and allele balance, and you can use these for other kinds of masking things. But let's go back to our X and Y, and I'm going to show you this in practice. And first, I hope you'll appreciate the best plot in the history of X and Y chromosome plots. You'll notice 
the X chromosome along the X axis and the Y chromosome along the Y axis. And, and I know it's me and the one person who made that plot that loves this plot so much, and now I hope you all appreciate it a little bit. Uh, but the dot plot of sequence similarity, the pseudoautosomal regions are one to one. We have these chunks of sequence in the, the, this younger part of um, X and Y that are one to one, but they're kind of jumbled around. And we, just to make things fun, because why would biology um, not keep us on our toes? Humans have an X transposed region that's human specifics, not even shared with chimpanzees. And it's more than 95% identical between the X and the Y chromosome. This region got a lot of play for a little bit because it has a gene expressed in the brain. And oh gosh, humans have a duplication of a gene expressed in the brain. This is what makes us not chimps. I mean, no, but, <laughs> but it got the X chromosome a little bit of emphasis in the public media for about five minutes. So there's these, these regions, pseudotosomal X transposed region. And if we look, this is this dot plot, this is read depth. And, and the thing I want you to take home is that pseudotosomal region is just, it's not fitting with the depth of the rest of the X and then it's gonna look like a little hump and then there's this teeny teeny pseudotosomal region two and if I knew how to make GIFs, I would have made one, but instead you're just gonna bear with me going forward and back. So if we do alignment the way that I think we should be doing it, we're gonna get the pseudo-autosomal region not quite getting up to the rest of the X chromosome. I'm troubleshooting that still, but, but getting a lot better. And the X transposed region, if we look at that, it goes from being a little pot belly to being where it should be. And this teeny, teeny pseudo-autosomal region is getting better. There's a lot of little windows on there that we can't see very clearly, but that we are improving read depth on. And the other is map quality. So this is how much do we trust it. And in genomics, we filter out regions with low map quality a lot. And here, we'd just completely filter out the pseudo-autosomal region one. We'd filter out the X-transposed region because it, what the quality is, is, one of the things quality says is, how likely is this read to map identically somewhere else in the genome? And if we've given it two identical regions to map to, it will map 100% to two different regions. And it, we just won't look at it. And if we haven't actually looked at our data or thought about the biology or evolution, we're just gonna miss that completely in our genomics. When you're running through 22 autosomes, X and Y and mitochondrial DNA, why, why care about 5% of the genome, really? I mean, it's not like there's any missing heritability there, any sex differences or, oh. Okay, so, um, but we can fix the quality, especially um, in these regions. Um, and this is just a take home. So this is um, read balance and just think about it. These are all reads from our XX individual on the Y chromosome. So this is a Y chromosome sucking up reads that should go elsewhere in the genome because this individual doesn't have a Y. We have every indication to believe this individual doesn't have a Y and yet we're getting all of these reads mapping to the Y chromosome. Um, I, have, I have a couple more minutes and then time for questions, perfect. So just this, it's not just a problem for DNA, it's a problem for RNA. So this is some, some other work from my lab. Um, I just wanna highlight, I, I learned, I spent two semesters learning microarray analysis when I was in graduate school because that's what everyone was gonna be doing forever. And, um, but microarrays even had this problem where the probes were not always developed to be X and Y specific. They were designed based on the reference genome and so we had to go in to the probe sets originally and filter out X and Y specific probe sets. And the fact is we haven't gotten over that. RNA-seq is, is susceptible to the same problems. Um, and so we've done just looking at FPKM, fragments per kilobase a million mass read, in females versus males, and look at just genetic differences. This is in the blood. Um, and when we do a sex-specific reference, we identify many more genes as being sex differently expressed. So that's pretty exciting. And I'm gonna show you the top the top hits is being most differentially expressed. If we use a sex-specific reference versus a default reference, and, and you'll say, congratulations, doctor, you have figured out that XY individuals have Y-linked genes expressed, and XX individuals do not. And I will tell you that everyone else who's done this before thought that they weren't differentially expressed. And that's really critical if we think about X and Y-linked gene pairs where sometimes they have shared function, sometimes the Y-linked genes have developed a new function. We see this in TSPX and TSPY in liver cancer specifically. The X and the Y-linked gene pair have diverged uh, significantly in form and function, and there may actually be sex differences in those gametologs. 
that are leading to some of the sex differences in the disease. Um, so we can use this for mapping. We can look at trisomies, monosomies, all of this. The software is available. Just please don't publish it without us. Uh, it'd be sad panda. And um, thanks to everyone in the lab, um, to some of the funding we've had, and thank you all for being here.